Welcome to Hyperpolitical Good Activist Learning, which is Make a Difference. My name is Dr. Carlos Yebra Lopez, and today we're going to do a close reading of a fascinating article on YouTube polyglots. Now, bear with me as I share the screen. This article was published a couple of years ago in 2021, and its title as you can see on the screen, is Language Hackers, YouTube Polyglots as Representative Figures of Language Learning in Late Capitalism, written by Alberto Brutos in 2021. Now, I'm going to divide this presentation into four parts, the first of which is the what and the why of the article, what exactly is the point of the article and why is it relevant. Then I'll discuss the difference between the polyglot community on the one hand, and the polyglot industry on the other. Third, I will tackle the part of the article that deploys critical discourse analysis to explore how late capitalism is related to the evolution of polyglots as quote-unquote language hackers. And finally, I will delve into the contradictions spotted by Bruthos apropos the discourse of YouTube polyglots on language learning. Now, what is the article about? The article is essentially a critical analysis of discourses on language learning that are spread by YouTube polyglots. And in particular, Bruthos is concerned with how those discourses about language learning mirror the political and economic context of post 1970s capitalism. Now, even though the author uses the word mirror at some point, I wonder whether that is the best word because mirror will suggest a passive reflection, whereas you could also argue that those discourses by YouTube polyglots in turn influence the political and economic context of post 1970s capitalism rather than just being a passive receptacle of it, right? So there is a certain performativity in those discourses especially in so far as they come from so-called micro-celebrities, right? As they come from influencers. Precisely because they have that influence, that influence must have some kind of effects so that the relationship between the context and those discourses goes both ways to some extent. Now, why I think this article is crucial, it's because it is rarely the case that people within the polygon community read what critical linguists and academics are writing and vice versa. Critical linguists, particularly in academia, are normally not familiar with the main figures and celebrities of the polyglot community. So, for instance, Richard Simcott, known as the godfather of the movement, as Bruce quotes himself in the article, is not really a well-known figure in academia in departments of linguistics, even though he's arguably the most famous in the polyglot community, and vice versa. Some of the most brilliant professors, lecturers, etc., such as the author himself, are not the most well-known within the polyglot community slash industry. So it is very rarely that we have the opportunity to put these two worlds together in a productive and fruitful dialogue. And that's what I think makes this article particularly interesting. Bruthus summarizes the argument of this article in the first paragraph of the conclusion, which is here at the bottom of the screen. YouTube polyglots, he says, are representative figures of the globalized and hyper-connected world produced by the technological and social acceleration characteristic of post this capitalism. Consequently, the discourses are suffused with the values of this period, speed, efficiency, entrepreneurialism, and individuality. I think that pretty much summarizes the article, but there's much more to it. Let's see it. Let's go to section two, the polygon community, how it came about, and how has it morphed into a polygon industry, to what extent. Now, we can distinguish between three aspects. First, the origins. The polygon community 
itself was born as an online community, right, on the internet. And it was essentially about people who were serial language learners, but they found themselves isolated in the offline reality. They wouldn't find someone who was as passionate as them, had such a vested interest in language learning as them. So they resorted to the internet to find like-minded individuals in forums and YouTube channels. And when these individuals came together, the polyglot community as such started to crystallize. Now, this begs the question of who belongs in the polyglot community? Now, famously, Judith Mayer established a couple of criteria that Bruce has quotes in his article. These are, first, anyone who loves to learn languages. And notice here that the emphasis is on passion rather than ability or skill. And second, that person needs to be a regular contributor. Perhaps it's in polyglot meetings like the polyglot conference or the polyglot gathering or it's in online forums or on YouTube channels, but in some sort of platform shared by polyglots, that person who has a claim to belonging in the polyglot community needs to be a regular collaborator, right? Now, obviously, these criteria are problematic. I think they are useful that they can offer us a working definition of who counts as a polyglot within the polyglot community, but it is also true that the emphasis on passion obscures slash erases a number of factors. For instance, inequality of access. It is much easier to participate in the polygon gathering, for instance, which has always been organized in Europe, if you're already based in Europe. Also, there's an economic divide, right? Sometimes the fees, the accommodation, etc. all of that adds up so that the people who have less money are less likely to participate. So loving languages is not enough. There are a number of logistic aspects that ought to be considered and that ultimately make the so-called polygon community what Trujillo has called a North Atlantic universal, meaning a category that represents itself or whose proponent represents as universal, but that nonetheless is very local in the sense that it privileges a certain part of the world with a certain socio-economic status, etc. In this case, the global north and Europe, which is why the polyglot community has an over-representation of white people from Europe, particularly males. Now, then there is the claim by Brussels that even though the polyglot community is very broad, because it's just relying on these two criteria, when it comes to it, the core of it, he says, and I think that this question might be problematic, the core of it are just 15 to 30 YouTube polyglots that have certain authority as recognized by all the members of the community, right? And I think that the idea of the core is problematic because it implies that the more influence or authority they have, the better they represent the polygon community. Whereas you could argue that the opposite is true. You could argue that insofar as these authors are micro celebrities within the polygon community, they are the utmost representation of the industrialization of the polygon community, which from a conservative standpoint could be interpreted as a devolution of the original spirit of the polyglot community, which was amateurism, collaboration, not necessarily concerning, not necessarily an interest in profit or fame. And Bruce here draws upon a quote from the polyglot conference itself to summarize what the origins of the community are. It says, before the web and social media, polyglots tended to be solitary creatures studying on their own and pursuing what were often viewed as eccentric or inexplicable pursuits. The internet changed that by making geography irrelevant to a certain extent, right? And uniting language lovers across great distances. New language sites and social media brought about the formation of a self-conscious collaborative online community. In 2007, the first YouTube videos from polyglots began appearing online. Again, at the beginning, 
it was about passion for languages, not necessarily linked to profit and collaboration with like-minded individuals, right? Which is not necessarily what it is today. And as to the notion of the core, right? This is the quote from Brussos. At the core of this community, meaning the polyglot community, there is a group of 15 to 30 internet polyglots or YouTube polyglots who are accepted as authorities on language learning by a reasonable number of people online. They are the pillars of the polyglot community. And I think that what comes now kind of clarifies in what sense Brutus means that these people are the core of the polyglot community as opposed to something different. Polyglots come together around them and often because of them. So I think that what Brutus means here is that these people are the core of the polyglot community, not in terms of representativity necessarily, but in terms of influence on how many people and institutions related to polyglossia they are able to have an impact on. So from this perspective, perhaps the notion of core is not as problematic, but then again, it still suggests certain centrality, right? Which can be disputed. Now, as you can see on this slide, the question is whether these people are part of the polyglot community, let alone the core of it, or rather of something different that's, that has come about over the years, which we could term the polygon industry, meaning the state of the polygon community after it has undergone a process of industrialization and language commodification and branding, right? So here we have Luca Lampariello on the left side, Jan and Lucas, who I wasn't familiar with before reading his article, I must confess. Oli Richards, we have also Lao Shu, right? Moses McCormick. We have Benny, Lewis, Steve Kaufman, and Lydia Machaba. Hopefully I pronounced that sounding more or less right. And I've, I've left for the last intentionally the figure of Richard Simcott because as Brutus himself recognizes in the article, Richard Simcott is unlike any other in the polygon community slash industry. And there is two aspects. First, in that he was a pioneer of the community, and as such, he is recognized by many around the political community. And second, because his efforts are not primarily or oriented even in any case or aspect towards the generation of profit. This is not his full-time job, and he does not make uh, a living out of languages, right? So in this sense, I think, that sets him apart from the rest of the people that you can see on the screen who, let's say, promote their courses and products and services in a more aggressive fashion, right? I also want to clarify that I've been in touch with um, Richard Simcoe many times as part of the language event in Edinburgh or the Polygon Conference in Cholula, Mexico, and the upcoming language event in Edinburgh again. And... I can only say positive things about Richard. I think he's a truly inspirational figure and he's a force of good in the community. I don't know about the rest of these individuals personally. I've never met them in person, never talked to them, never took any of their courses or bought any of their products or services. So I wouldn't be able to comment on that regard. Now, here's another interesting idea that Brussels discusses apropos the core right, the so-called core, these 15 to 30 influential polyglots of whom he explicitly mentions the ones I just discussed in the previous slide, right? He talks about a transition from amateurism and collaboration to commercialization and branding. He says, the turn from amateurism and collaboration, new language sites and social media brought about the formation of a self-conscious collaborative online community toward commercialization and branding. This evolution ran parallel with YouTube's shift from an amateur user-generated content medium to a professional broadcasting channel, which in fact repeated the historical trajectory of the internet. Again, that mirroring relationship between the evolution of the internet context on the one hand and that of YouTube polyglots on the other. Until 2005, most internet platforms thrived on the enthusiasm of users as they ran and operated their new virtual spaces. 
During the following years, corporate owners kept nourishing the image of platforms as peer protection structures that put users before profits, while at the same time, they started developing business models to increase monetization. So again, there is a certain parallel with YouTube polyglots in the sense that discursively they encourage collaboration, right? But on the other hand, and at the same time, there is a certain shift or pivoting towards the monetization of their content. Now, the reason I have highlighted amateurism toward commercialization and branding in red, it's because, yes, there's been a professionalization of YouTube polyglots as far as YouTube is concerned. However, most of these YouTube polyglots are amateurs still in a different but relevant sense which is that they lack formal training in linguistics and yet they're offering services related to linguistics, right? And I think that this is also very important when it comes to analyzing their discourse because their self-narratives and promotion of their products and services tends to obfuscate this idea or even try to turn negatives into positives, as in my BA or BSc is completely unrelated to linguistics but it gave me the chance of being a more structured individual or managing time better, which is also important to optimize language learning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This aspect is not discussed in the article, but I think it's very important when it comes to understanding the discursive construction of language learning by YouTube politics. Now, in 2006, there is a shift, right? that takes place on YouTube and that determines this monetization transition, right? As Bruce says in the article, after being acquired by Google in 2006, YouTube gradually underwent the process of professionalization aimed at raising the quality of its programming in order to attract more adver advertisers. Over the years, they transformed the role of aspiration and aspirations of YouTubers, pushing them to turn themselves into small scale entrepreneurs. Through the YouTube partner program, channels with at least 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours in the previous 12 months may be eligible to activate different monetization features. YouTubers' income may come as well from other sources such as book deals, branding merchandise, sponsorship deals, and TV contracts. The evolution of YouTube political videos mirrors the platform's transition from amateurism to professionalization. Again, I think the birth mirrors here might be understating the ability of YouTube polyglots to in turn have a certain influence on the political and economic context of which the evolution of YouTube is part. But other than that, I do think there is, of course, an influence from this monetization policy adopted by YouTube to the discursive strategies adopted by YouTube polyglots in turn. Now, what is exactly the nature of this relationship between the political and economic context on the one hand and the discourses adopted by YouTube polyglots on the other. In order to elucidate this, Brussels resorts to critical discourse analysis, which I think is a very felicitous decision. It has helped his analysis reach interesting conclusions, not the least of which are the contradictions that he is able to spot thanks to this. Here, I think it was a very good idea by Brussels to include an explicit definition of critical discourse analysis, because in part, it helps us understand better what he meant by the relationship between the political and economic context on the one hand and the discourse adopted by YouTube polyglots on language learning on the other. So he envisages critical discourse analysis as an approach to study discursive change in relation to social and cultural change. I think that is a very nice summary by Fairclough. That is to say, critical discourse analysis studies discourse as a site of political struggle, positing that social, political, and cultural changes exist as discourses as well as processes that are taking place outside discourse, and that discourses and non-discursive processes are in dialectic relationship with each other. That is the key expression, dialectic relationship. So now we're no longer thinking about a reflective relationship between the political and economic context on the one hand and the youth of polyglots discourses on the other. 
Now, thanks to this expression, dialectic relationship, we know we're talking about a two-way street whereby the context influences the discourse, but also those discourses have a certain influence on the context, particularly because they come from micro-celebrities, i.e. influencers, right? So it follows by definition that they might have a certain impact on the things that are beyond themselves, right? Including the context. From my understanding of Rousseau's analysis, one can distinguish between three milestones in the political and economic context that shapes and will be shaped by YouTube Polygot's discourses on language learning. The first milestone is the 1973 to 75 recession or crisis, which gave way to a number of processes that in turn influenced those YouTube Polygot's discourses. The first of these is the accelerated production and consumption. That's what allows us to understand the emphasis of YouTube Polyglots down the road on serial language learning. The emphasis placed by Benny Lewis at the beginning and then others based on him on developing language, quote unquote, hacks, meaning shortcuts towards the acquisition of languages, meaning processes of acceleration towards those goals, right? Now, in addition to this, there is a commodification process whereby languages become commodities, but also YouTube polyglots become themselves commodities within the global market of language teaching and learning. Hence, the increased adoption of polyglot branding strategies over time. There is also individualization, which makes it look as though language learning is rather an individual process before being a social one, when we know that this is not actually the case. And finally, there is an emphasis on efficiency. And that is what allows us to understand why within the polygon industry slash community nowadays, we see so much emphasis on conversational fluency as the joystick by which to measure the speaker's ability in a certain language. Okay. Yes, you, you claim that you speak German, but are you fluent? That seems to be the benchmark. That is what G Gareth Popkins called the sexy skill, meaning there is a listening skill, there is the reading skill, there is a writing skill, but nobody seems to be interested in any of these as the foremost exponent of one's competence in the target language. Why is it always fluency? Well, part of that is because conversational fluency is couched as representative of efficiency, which is one of the foremost values in the post fordist late capitalism. Now, the second milestone is the development of the internet in the 1990s, which is itself the conditions in a quantum of the emergence and consolidation of the polygon community. But in addition to that, it also implies a more intense technological acceleration. And that goes hand in hand with the conceptualization of language as a technical skill that can be segmented, that can be ranked, that can be taught according to industrialization processes, right? In the same image of them. And then there is an increased globalization as a result of the internet, as an increased interconnectedness of people across the globe, which results in more homogeneity, which in turn makes individual and singular differences more valuable than ever. That's why we have a revalorization of minoritized languages as indexes of, as being representative of, exoticism and true, real, genuine authenticity. They are the bastions, the last territories or pockets of authenticity, according to this reconceptualization. And lastly, we have a change of policy by YouTube, which leads to professionalization, which leads to better edits, leads to new strategies of monetization, etc. And as a result, we witness, Rousseau's mentions, a process of disembedding in at least two senses. First, it looks as though the language itself is removed from 
the community of its speakers. So you see YouTube polyglots speaking Swahili without ever interacting with people whose first language is Swahili, for instance, right? And there is a decent bet in, in another sense, which is that other than English, languages are reduced to what Chandler calls post-vernacularity. This is not the term used by Brussos in the article. Brussos talks about the symbolic value of the language, but it's essentially the same. It means that unless the language I'm using as a YouTube polyglot is English, I'm using that language to signify something else. I'm not using that language to convey meaning or to vehiculate my discourse. I'm using that language to signify status, to signify knowledge, to represent expertise, to index my cultural capital, etc. That is the post vernacularity, as opposed to your, as opposed to the use of that language to convey meaning, which will be vernacularity, right? And finally, and I think this is the most important, fascinating aspect of this article, is the contradictions that the adoption of critical discourse analysis as a method allows the author to unearth. And these contradictions are as follows. First, YouTube polyglots seem to be at the same time both utterly original and yet the same. In the words of the author, polyglot narratives of personal success and discovery are in conflict with their own discursive uniformity. Everybody has a different story, but they all converge in the same tropes, which leads us to think that they all partake from the same discursive strategies. Therefore, they can be explained as part of an industry, right? as part of the generation of the same archetype with different individual touches. Another aspect that allows us to talk about a political industry as opposed to community is that Oftentimes you see that due to followers recommend each other's services, quote each other. There is an undeniable self-referentiality that allow us to conceptualize that community as a rather industrialized dynamic. The second aspect is, as we said before, that there is a speech or a language practice without reference to that community of speakers, right? And that's why Brutus talks about the disconnect between language and actual speech communities in political videos. The third contradiction is that the methods that these YouTube polyglots offer seem to be unique, yet at the same time, there are repackagings of methods that we've seen many times before, right? So in his own words, Similarly, the techniques, principles, and routines promoted by YouTube polyglots are far from innovative. They are essentially bundles of common practices and techniques. And I completely agree with the author here that this dimension is obscured by the fact that those methods have pompous names, right? Oh, the, the super duper definitive method to this, the unique absolute rocket method to language learning, but when it comes to it, at the end of the day, all of these methods are very, very similar. What changes is the packaging, but not the content itself. And finally, number four, these YouTube polyglots all take pride in being autodidacts, all take pride in self-teaching, and yet some or all of the services they're offering are based on teaching that language or languages to somebody else. In other words, do as I say, not as I do. In Brusso's words, the fact that YouTube polyglots are in the business of selling language courses is in contradiction with their rejection of quote-unquote conventional language teaching and their emphasis on these courses of self-directedness in language learning. Well, that was all from me. I hope you found this close reading interesting. I will make sure to link the article in question in the description below so you can all access it and read it carefully. It is absolutely worth it, and I hope that more scholars publish articles at the intersection between the polyglot community and critical linguistics and social linguistics. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments down below, and as always, thanks for watching.